Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support, please subscribe. Comparing the executions of Henry VIII's wives, Anne Boleyn versus Catherine Howard. There has been a lot of discussion on this channel recently about two wives of Henry VIII in particular, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. But when you delve deeper into their lives, there are only a couple of things that the pair had in common. Both Anne and Catherine were married to Henry, both were then used by Henry, and both were then executed by order of Henry. But I want to look into the shocking differences between their arrests, their imprisonments, their treatment and their executions, and then look into the shocking differences around the treatment of their bodies once they were killed. Anne Boleyn is a name that many can pinpoint and say, oh yes, she was married to King Henry VIII. Her legacy is a daughter who became a queen who reigned for a staggering 45 years. But what do we know about Catherine Howard without researching her? It appears that Catherine has been almost forgotten in history. A young girl who was used and abused by the men in her life and not protected by her guardians. In today's video, I want to look into these staggering differences not to alienate one woman over the other, but to highlight the despicable treatment that one faced more so than the other in a bid to rid the world of any evidence of her existence. Now Anne Boleyn found herself being the first Queen of England to be arrested, and then faced charges that had a penalty of death. A plot created by Thomas Cromwell to oust the Queen from her seat of power, and to also allow the King to then legally end the marriage and find a new bride. Anne wasn't aware of what she was being charged with until her trial, but even up until the point of her execution, Anne was treated like a queen. An important aspect to remember is that Anne retained her title as queen until her death, a stark contrast to Catherine Howard, who was stripped of everything the second she was arrested. Another similar factor is that both women were arrested for committing adultery against the king, but in Anne's case, adultery should have just landed her in a nunnery. But the thing that Anne was executed for was actually treason. She, but the thing that Anne was executed for was actually treason. She was accused of plotting to kill the king, and so treasonous adultery and incest with her brother were the crimes she was convicted of. After Catherine Howard had been arrested, key word after, a law that made it treason for a queen consort not to disclose her sexual history to the king within the first twenty days of marriage as well to commit adultery against her royal husband, was introduced. This law was called the Royal Assent by Commission Act 1541. This act meant there was no need for a trial, and the evidence was therefore stacked against the helpless Catherine Howard, who was sentenced to death. So although Anne and Catherine both ended up in the same place, only one was given a trial, whilst the other did not. A sad point, however, is, even though Anne Boleyn had a trial, she was not given a chance to defend herself, and the only people who could have helped her were executed themselves for being the individuals she supposedly had affairs with. When it came to the arrests of these two ladies, Anne Boleyn was at Greenwich Palace, and she was taken by barge down river to the Tower of London. Her journey took a staggering three hours, and she was taken up into the tower by the Queen's stairs. Anne had still not been convicted of her apparent crimes, so she was still a queen. Anne was fearing that she'd be placed into the Tower Dungeons, but instead she was put into the Royal Apartments, a location she had used just three years previously for her coronation. Catherine Howard, however, was taken from Hampton Court Palace. She was manhandled by the Lords in a panicked frenzy, and she was placed onto a barge to go along the river to the Tower. She was taken under London Bridge, and she would have seen the heads of those she was accused of having affairs with. Unlike Anne, Catherine had her title stripped from her the second she was arrested. She was no longer a queen and was treated in such a manner. She was brought into the tower via traitor's gate and was held in a cell, a vast contrast to Henry's previous queen, Anne. Although both women had been arrested, one was treated as a queen, well, sort of, and the other had her title stripped and was treated as a criminal. After both subsequent arrests, one had a trial and one did not but both were condemned to die. Anne was to be executed one of three ways, and Henry was given the choice to what form of execution Anne would have faced. The usual punishment for treason was to be hung, drawn and quartered, but because Anne was a woman, 
this would have been downgraded to just being hung. Secondly, Anne could have been burnt at the stake for witchcraft or Anne could have been executed by means of beheading. This is the moment where Henry showed his wife and queen a touch of mercy. Out of the three executions, one is the least painful and less likely to go wrong. Henry chose the execution via means of beheading. But he didn't stop there. Henry arranged for a swordsman to come over from Calais to perform the execution. For Henry knew that beheading via axe has a tendency to go wrong and can often result in multiple painful blows. But a sword is swift and instant. Anne was walked from her apartments to the scaffold on the day of her execution. And she saw the scaffold for the first time. Anne looked petrified and hoped for a royal pardon, something that never came. The lieutenant of the tower helped Anne up the scaffold and then Anne turned to her ladies and comforted the sobbing women. Anne saw the executioner a man who looked apprehensive about what he was about to do, but the sword in which would take her life was hidden out of sight under the straw of the scaffold, an act in which was done as to not alarm Anne. Anne was then given permission to speak. Witnesses in the crowd said that Anne smiled and came across as having a cheerful countenance. Anne then turned and addressed the crowd, and she said the following, Good Christian people, I am come hither to die, for according to the law, and by the law, I am judged to die, and therefore I will speak nothing against it. I am come hither to accuse no man, nor to speak anything of that, whereof I am accused and condemned to die. But I pray God save the king, and send him long to reign over you, for a gentler nor a more merciful prince was there never. And to me he was ever a good, a gentle, and sovereign lord, and if any person will meddle of my cause, I require them to judge the best. And thus I take my leave of my world and of you all, and I heartily desire you all to pray for me. O Lord, have mercy on me. To God I commend my soul. Historians believe that Anne's last words were a last moment attempt to try and get the king to look kindly upon their daughter, Elizabeth, a daughter that when Anne was killed then went to live with Anne's sister Mary for a short while. Anne was then invited to confess the truth. She replied by saying, I know I shall have no pardon, for they shall know no more from me. Anne maintained her innocence right till the very end of her life. The swordsman also took off his shoes, something that was done so that Anne would not hear him approach when the moment came. The executioner also knelt before Anne and begged her for forgiveness for what he was about to do. After this, he then asked Anne to kneel and say her prayers. After being blindfolded and kneeling at the block, Anne repeated several times, To Jesus Christ I commend my soul. Lord Jesus, receive my soul. Anne said, Jesu, have pity on my soul, and it was at this point that the executioner silently removed the sword and signalled to his assistant to make a noise to distract the queen before swinging his sword twice over his head to gain momentum, and then, with one swift swing, he removed Anne's head. The crowd was in shock, their queen was now dead, and they began to weep. Initially, Anne's ladies used a linen cloth to cover her, and they then picked it up, along with the rest of her body. The three ladies refused to allow any man to touch the body of their queen, so together they carried her away. Catherine Howard was not given the luxury of a sword. She was beheaded via the commoner's axe. Catherine was held in a prison cell, and then, the night before her execution, she was told to dispose of her soul, and she should prepare for death for she was to die at nine o'clock the next morning. The night before her execution, Catherine spent hours praying. She is also thought to have practiced placing her head onto the block. According to Eustace Chapwee, Catherine requested that the block be brought to her so that she might know how to place herself. Her request was granted and the block was brought into her chamber. On the morning of February 13th, Catherine woke early and made her way out of the apartment that she was imprisoned in and towards the scaffold that had been erected for her execution. It's said that Catherine approached and she was terrified and pale. She was so scared of what coming next that she needed help climbing the stairs. 
Once on the scaffold, Catherine was so weak she could hardly speak, but she said that she had merited a hundred deaths for so offending the king, who had so graciously treated her. It is also said that she then asked all Christian people to take regard under her worthy and just punishment with death, for her offences against God, and heinously from her youth upward, in breaking all of his commandments, and also against the king's royal majesty very dangerously. There is a rumour throughout history that states the following. When Catherine was on the scaffold, she said, I die a queen, but I would rather die the wife of Culpepper. Catherine was so weak that she struggled to speak. The fear had overtaken her. The executioner then gave Catherine a blindfold, which she then placed over her eyes. Then, as Catherine had practised the night before, she knelt down and placed her head onto the block. There was a large crowd there to witness her death, and as the executioner raised the extremely sharp axe, they gasped. Then, with one swift blow, the executioner struck Catherine's neck and removed her head from her body. It was at this point that the executioner picked up Catherine's head by her hair and removed her blindfold. He held her head up to the crowd and showed her lifeless face and proclaimed, God save the king. Catherine was taken by her ladies after being covered with a black cloak to the chapel of St Peter ad Vincula, where she was then laid to rest. A sad fact is, after Catherine Howard's body was placed into the ground, her body wrapped in the black cloak, a large quantity of quicklime or lye was poured over her lifeless corpse. There is speculation as to why. It does not appear to be for hygienic reasons or odour reasons. Catherine's grave is the only in the chapel to have had this horrendous substance used, leading to the sad matter that someone wanted nothing of poor Catherine Howard to remain. But saying that the marker for Catherine's grave actually marks her grave is a guess. Catherine's body is the only in the whole of the chapel to have not been located. But that being said, one place in the chapel does show evidence of quicklime, suggesting that Catherine's grave is located in that spot. The marker we see above ground is merely a commemorative plaque to show remembrance to the once queen. An interesting but sad thing to look at is the way the scaffold was prepped in both instances. A black mourning cloth made from velvet was for Anne, but the scaffold was only covered in straw and hay for Catherine. Although neither women were given a coffin to be placed to rest in, an arrow chest was brought for Anne, and she after death was placed into this. Catherine was sadly only placed into the hole that had been prepared, and as I have previously stated, quick lime was poured over her lifeless body, a heinous and disgusting act that shows no respect for the young girl. Even after death, she was mistreated. Both women were married to the king, both women were queens. Both women were used and abused by the men in their lives. Anne changed the face of England through her part in splitting England from Rome and creating the Church of England. She started her reign as a queen that the majority of the country disliked for her treatment of Catherine of Aragon. But she died a queen whom the country weeped for. She left a legacy through her daughter, Queen Elizabeth I, and even today, she is remembered through future generations via her sister, especially through the current line of royal succession. Future generations of Bolins honour Anne through many ways, but one that sticks out is through leaving roses on the anniversary of her death each year on her grave. Catherine Howard, however, leaves behind only her reputation in a grave in the chapel at the Tower of London. Historians have over the years been unkind in their descriptions of her character, with only a minority of biographers being sympathetic to her and her charges. The differences we find between the two executed wives of Henry VIII is staggering. Although both did die terrible deaths, Anne is certainly more remembered. 
Catherine Howard was sexually abused and exploited. She was let down by her guardian, and men who would take advantage of her were given free access to her in an unsupervised manner. Henry Mannix, for instance, was in a position of trust as her music teacher, and he used Catherine's naivety to his advantage. But Henry Mannix was just the beginning for Catherine, the start of a horrendous journey that would end with Catherine paying the highest price. Many blame Catherine's fate on Catherine's actions leading up to the point of her death, but maybe if we just stop and look at the facts, we can see that Catherine Howard was a victim, who like many others, died at the behest of the tyrant king and his advisers. Anne's death was a combination of the king's wandering eye and obsession to look for a woman who could provide him with a male heir, and also the political scheming and manipulation of Thomas Cromwell. Anne spoke out against Cromwell, and this was incredibly dangerous, especially as he and the king were plotting her downfall. The cause of Anne Boleyn's death is deeper than what occurred at the Tower. The real cause of her death is the impatience and despicable feelings that Henry VIII possessed for her after her failed pregnancies, something she could not help, and also the political schemings of a power-obsessed advisor who would do almost anything to remain in the king's favour. Both women were brave and courageous, both died at the hands of a man who was known throughout the world as a tyrant. Comparing both women shows us the unjust treatment in an already unjust circumstance, and it shows that although both women suffered, one suffered far greater than the other, even after death. Thank you for watching, and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.